Thank you. Um, right, I now call the Chamber to order again and can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate on 100 years of women in British Armed Forces to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Maurice Corrie to open the debate. Mr Corrie, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for the adjournment to allow my, my guests to take their seats. Um, it's an honour to begin this debate today. And firstly, I'd like to thank the members whose support for my motion has allowed this debate to happen today. I'm also delighted to welcome to the Chamber female representatives of the Royal Navy, the Royal Military Police, and a number of female veterans and women uh, from the forces. Between them, they have decades of service and dedication to our country, and I'm sure the whole Chamber would want to join me in thanking them for their service. It's great to see you all here today, and thank you for attending. And in, as I say, and I'd like to um, welcome members of St. Michael and All Angels Church in Helensburg towards the back there, who amongst them have several serving members of the armed forces in their parish and also veterans. Uh, now, being in Helensburgh, of course, they cover uh, Her, Her Majesty's naval base Clyde, Fast Lane, and Coolport. And, of course, um, the parish extends to cover a very large number of people in the population there. I'm very appreciative of their presence here today and welcome them. Members know the phrase, those magnificent men and their flying machines. But I would like to put forward the phrase, those, those wonderful women and their flying machines. Following on, members may recall documentaries on the BBC television over recent years about the incredibly brave work members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force undertook. The work was to deliver new aircraft to operational airfield bases from the manufacturers. This involved flying, often solo, fighter aircraft and light and heavy bombers with very limited navigational aids and in extreme weathers of all sorts. By their bravery and superb skills, our frontline RAF squadrons, both, um, <coughs> both fighter and bomber squadrons, were able to achieve success on air operations in the Second World War. No more was this demonstrated than in the Battle of Britain's victory, with replacement Spitfires and Hurricanes being brought to forward to squadrons by these wonderful women in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Today, women are involved in most areas of the British Armed Forces, Many of you will have seen news reports and documentaries of our Aeromed teams and our Aeroevac teams operating in Iraq and Afghanistan. These teams contain many female doctors, nurses, and medics. And interestingly, many of these women were recruited uh, for the, were joined up as reservists from the NHS. And in particular, I'm glad to say, uh, it, NHS Tayside and Nine Wells Hospital, to name but a few, amongst others in the UK hospitals. Here we see women stepping forward to serve their country in the time of need. It is not well known enough, um, but women being able to serve in the armed forces was actually driven forward by a Scotswoman, Mona Chalmers Watson. During the First World War, she served as the first controller of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or the WAC. She led a force that would have been more than 57,000 women strong, serving from July 1917 to 1921, including 10,000 women in France itself. Mona Chalmers Watson is a fascinating individual. Not only was she one of the founders and main drivers behind, behind the WAAC, but she was also the first woman to, to obtain her MD in medicine from the University of Edinburgh's Medical College. She also edited the Encyclopedia Medica, a 15-volume work, the first edition of which appeared in 1900, and was also published two books, Food and Feeding in Health and Disease in 1910 and The Book of Diet in 1913. She was also a noted suffragette herself before the establishment of the WAC. She had concentrated on improving the levels of pay offered to the women, taking over men's jobs, and she served as a doctor to the suffragette prisoners in Perth. Mona Chalmers Watson's regarded the creation of the Women's uh, Arm Auxiliary Corps as an advance of the women's movement and a national advance, and noted that for the first time, women had a direct and officially recognized share in the task of our armies, both at home and overseas. In a recruiting pamphlet, she wrote that, and I quote, this is the great opportunity for every strong, healthy, and active woman, not already employed and work or nas of national importance, to offer her service to her country. I go on, and I could go on more, but I'm sure everyone has got the flavor of just how impressive a woman Mona Chalmers Watson was in every aspect, including here in her military career. The impact of these changes, of course, not only affected the outcome of the First World War, but the impact has felt in every conflict since. During the Second World War, for example, women played a vital role in securing victory against Nazism, and more than 80,000 women in the women's land army at its height. 
Memberships of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force peaked at over 180,000, representing over 48 nationalities. And we are lucky enough to be joined today by Georgina Archibald in the gallery, who was a member of the WAAF, the WAF, and I, and I believe post the Second World War. She's here today with her daughter Fiona, who was a member of the Women's Royal Naval Service, and also granddaughter Lilius, who is currently an applicant to become a Royal Naval pilot. Welcome to you all. That's three generations of women serving our country and testament to the vital role that women have and will continue to play in our armed forces. It certainly makes me feel very humble indeed, and I'm sure to us members here as well today. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe that everyone should have the opportunity, if able, to serve our country in any way they can and see fit, which is why the Royal Air Force has been has, uh, having every role available to everyone able to meet the criteria, whatever gender is so welcome and welcome to join. Since 1917, women have played a vital and important role in our country's defence, and I'm sure in the next hundred years they will continue to play that vital role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Can I, I request members in the gallery, uh, members, uh, public in the gallery, not to applaud, tempting though it is, and I understand why, but it's not permitted. Uh, I now go to the open debate, speeches of four minutes. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Edward Mountain. Mr. MacDonald, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and I thank Maurice Corey for bringing the motion to the chamber for debate. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was created during 1917 and became the Army's first all-female unit, fulfilling essential medical and clerical roles, both in the UK and in France. In marking this centenary of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, we have to recognise why it was established. When war broke out in 1914, women queued alongside men to volunteer for whatever roles were available. However, the military view was that nursing was the only suitable role for women. During the course of the war, 19,000 women served as nurses and up to 100,000 as part of voluntary aid detachments. Female medics such as Dr. Elsie Ingalls, who graduated from the Edinburgh School of Medicine for Women in 1892, offered their services to the Royal Army Medical Corps, but was told, my good lady, go home and sit still. Supported by the suffragette societies, she set up her own female staffed hospital units and made their own way overseas, where their help was quickly accepted by the Belgians, the French and the Serbs. The attitude of the British military changed in 1916, when Britain faced a major manpower shortage due to mountain casualties and especially the slaughter on the Somme, where on the first day, British forces suffered 37,000 wounded and 19,000 fatalities for just three square miles of territory. Lieutenant General Lawson was asked to review the role of women in the military in early 1917. He examined how women were taking on men's jobs on the home front, and as a result, the idea of women performing basic military jobs no longer seemed ridiculous. His report found that supporting women to enter military service would release men for frontline duty. As the History Press website explains, the Corps was established in such a rush that the chief controllers were still negotiating details of pay and accommodation for months after the first draft arrived in France, and the Corps was not officially instituted until the 7th of July, 1917. It was clarified that the women had enrolled as civilians and would not be enlisted in the army. This was only a temporary force created out of necessity. By 1918, over 57,000 women had served in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, with 9,000 serving overseas. Five members were awarded the Military Medal, and 83 members died in service. Despite proving their worth, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was disbanded in 1920. It was nearly 20 years later, on the outbreak of World War II, that the Auxiliary, Auxiliary Territorial Service was formed as a women's branch of the British Army. Then finally, in 1948, the Women's Service Act was passed, allowing for a permanent peacetime role for women in British armed services. Now, today, 
the MOD of a crisis in recruitment and as a result will lift the ban on women in combat roles by the end of 2018. This is despite the size of our armed forces nearly halving since 1980, yet there is still a shortfall in recruits. The Filling the Ranks report states the Royal Navy and the RAF are now running at 10% short of their annual recruitment target, whilst the Army, the shortfall is over 30%. Presiding officer, I welcome the fact that finally women are to be treated equally for all roles in our armed forces. However, this should not be about filling the gaps in the ranks. If the MOD really want to address the recruitment crisis, then they should set pay at a level that attracts the best recruits instead of the paltry £14,931 per annum, which is less than the real living wage. Our armed forces personnel, men and women, deserve better. Thank you, Mr Macdonald. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As an ex-soldier, it is a pleasure to take part in this debate today. And I'd like to thank Maurice Corrie for bringing the motion forward so that the Parliament can celebrate the vital contribution made by women as part of the British Armed Forces. It's hard to believe that today, just over 100 years ago, at the outbreak of the First World War, the idea of women serving in our armed forces was considered to be ridiculous. And as Gordon MacDonald has said, a famous Scot, Elsie Inglis, a suffragette, and, and a doctor offered her medical services to the War Office, only to be flatly refused. And I think the words that she was told was, my good lady, go home and sit still. A dangerous comment I fear in those days, and one I only I repeat now as a quote, and I do so with caution. Because Elsie went on to establish the Scottish Women's Hospital, which saw the 1,500 women support our European al allies with the ambulance and drivers and orderlies and cooks they needed. By 1917, our armed forces changed their minds, and the first all-women unit in the British Army was officially instituted as the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. The creation of this unit heralded a start of a century of progress as far as women in our armed forces are concerned. And the unit was quickly joined by the Women's Royal Navy Service formed in 1917 and the Women's Royal Air Force formed in 1918. When the women were called upon to serve their country in the Second World War, again, they supported the campaigns on land, on the sea and in the air. And we should not forget that in World War II, even our Queen on the uniform to serve her country and our country. We should not forget also that there were women who served as part of the Special Operations Executive or the Baker Street Irregulars, as they were known. We still don't know all the stories involving ordinary women with extraordinary courage who served behind the lines. The last surviving female spy from World War II, Sonia Butt, or Agent Blanche, passed away in 2014. The fact that she had an MBE and mentioned in dispatches by the age of 20 gives an indication of her actions. Sonia would use her beauty to tease out information from German soldiers, but she was also deadly, wreaking havoc on the Nazis by blowing up bridges, rail lines and ambushing German convoys, helping turning the tide of the war in the Allies' favour. Her example has been replicated in many conflicts since the Second World War, and I'd like to pay tribute to those women who have served as part of our armed forces across the globe. We have seen women deployed on operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and a growing recognition of their importance to our armed services. And I know soldiers such as my son, who served in the conflict zones, see women as a critical part of our armed services. Presiding officer, in this debate, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the formation of the Women's, Royal, sorry, Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And it is their dedication which has led to Women's Service Act 50 years ago, which Mr. MacDonald mentioned, which finally allowed a permanent peacetime role for women in our armed service, uh, services. Ever since that point, the will of progress has continued to turn, and in recent years, the intake of female personnel has risen. 30%. 30% of our army cadets are indeed girls, and women have risen to the top ranks, with Major General Susan Ridge becoming the first ever general to serve in the British Army. So, presiding officer, it's right we pay tribute today to those women who served in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in World War I. We are conscious that not only did they gain the gratitude and 
of the men and women in the generation for their contribution, that, but they have blazed a trail for future generations of women to do the very same in every conflict thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Ms. Dugdale, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I pay uh, tribute to Maurice Corrie for securing this debate this afternoon? It is, of course, a fantastic uh, opportunity to pay tribute to all of the women who directly or indirectly uh, fought for our country. And I'm grateful to him for that. I'd also like to pay a personal tribute to uh, the women who are currently serving in our armed forces. And I'm aware of some uniforms uh, in the gallery. It's uh, all too rare that we have the opportunity to say thank you and to share our gratitude for the work that they do every day to keep us safe. So thank you for that. And I had the great privilege of thanking some of them in person when I last visited Redford Barracks around about at this time last year. I'd also like to thank Maurice Corrie for uh, bringing uh, Mona Geddes uh, uh, into my world. Uh, he referred to her as Mona Wilson. I know that she also has another persona as Dr. Alexandra Mary Chalmers Watson. She's had a number of, of names uh, over the years, and I won't repeat much of her uh, fantastic life uh, because Maurice Corrie uh, did that for us in his opening remarks. But he did mention that she was a suffragette who fought for equal pay for women who were doing the jobs of men uh, over 100 years ago. And we fight for that today, 100 years on. Uh, equally, he marked the fact that she was the first woman to graduate from Edinburgh University with a medicine degree in 1898, having completed a chemistry degree two years previous to that. But what he didn't mention was that she postponed her engagement and her marriage to her husband uh, at the time because she refused to marry him until she had those letters uh, after her name. What a lovely feminist uh, adage to have uh, on the memory books and to recollect just how important that was to her. He also mentioned the connection to Elsie Ingalls and of course they were friends and together established the Scottish Women's Hospital which Edward Mountain uh, also went on to recognise. We talk a lot about how we fail to um, put on record uh, the role that women played uh, in uh, the army or indeed in, in conflicts over the years and there are constant reminders to do so with official statues and uh, the member I'm sure will be aware that there's a, an ongoing campaign to have Elsie Ingalls remembered uh, in Edinburgh in particular. There are more statues uh, for dogs in Edinburgh than there are for women. I know presiding officer that as a, a friend of the, the canine that might not be an issue to you but it is to many people uh, across the uh, constituency who would like to see a formal recognition of Elsie Ingalls work. What's interesting to note, though, is that when Elsie Ingalls Memorial Hospital was here in Edinburgh, they named a wing of that hospital after Mona Geddes. So when the hospital uh, closed, we actually lost the one living memory to Mona Geddes that we have. Perhaps there's more that we can do uh, to recognise the role that women played over the past hundred years. In fact, many of the ways in which we do this in societal terms are done through popular culture. If you think of the countless TV programmes uh, that feature the women uh, in the First or Second World War rather than the men, my favourite book, The Night Watch, is focused entirely uh, around the role of female ambulance drivers in the Second World War, and I would encourage colleagues to read that. It's a crack and read. But the only statue I can uh, actually think of that has a, a female recognised in it for playing a role uh, in, the, uh, in the Second World War, in the First World War, is outside what is now a community centre in Gretna, and I visited that as party leader uh, this time last year, and that is, of course, uh, outside what used to be Her Majesty's munitions factory in Gretna, set up by David Lloyd George to provide the munitions for the First World War and it's generally recognised that without that factory we wouldn't have had the necessary material to provide the soldiers on the front line with and the war would not have been won without those women's work. The women who worked in those munitions factory were uh, commonly referred to as the Canary Girls because the nature of the chemicals they were using dyed their skin yellow and they lived with that throughout their whole lives and I was um, a, so pleased to see Russell Brown uh, back in 2015 when he was the MP for Gretna bring together all of the surviving women who'd worked in that munitions factory. Back in 2015, there were 11 living women uh, who had worked in that factory and seven of them came together uh, to mark uh, what they'd done during that time. And that leaves me with the thought, presiding officer, which I'll close on. I wonder whether the, uh, the minister might be able to reflect on that and think about what the Scottish Government could do in this centenary year to bring together any of the surviving women who had a role either in the Auxiliary Corps or indeed in that munitions factory to properly commemorate them and perhaps have some sort of lasting tribute to the women who served. So I thank Maurice Corrie for this opportunity and once again pay my tribute uh, to all the women who have served and continue to serve. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne, the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd also like to add my thanks to my colleague Maurice Corrie for bringing this debate to the Chamber. 
like my colleagues before me, I am honoured to be able to recognise the contribution of women uh, and the, the contribution they've made to the armed services and also to recognise the centenary of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. A hundred years ago, the war to end all wars introduces us to the concept of total war, where an entire economy shifts itself onto a war footing. Everyone's lives changed, and history did start a new era for women. With men away fighting, <laughs> women found themselves fulfilling every role in the factories, on the land, and in the forces. During that time, the suffragettes used a slogan in the argument for women to have the vote, and that was, men may bear arms, but women bear armies. I have no doubt that our Scottish suffragettes, if they were here today, would be joining us with pride, despite some of their reservations about women serving. Because women not now, only have, not now not only have the vote, but as a woman, I'm also able to stand here as a member of parliament, as the wife of an ex-army officer, and the mother of sons who served on the front of line in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I've also been able to serve in my own right as a commissioned officer in the RAFERT. In, my early, in the early noughties, I received a message from a friend. He was a tornado pilot stationed in the Falklands. And the message went something like this. The world has turned on its axis. I am standing here in an apron with all my male colleagues preparing afternoon tea for the local people while the skies are being patrolled by an all-female air crew. I think that was the first at the time. And it certainly changed the perspective of my male friends in the RAF. But I want to take you back and I want to finish up what I'm going to say today with a thought. A lady came forward and put a message on um, a bottle recently and it said, um, some, some serve and some give all. And as a young girl, I was incredibly moved by a poem that was given, it was, it was written by a gentleman called Marx and it was given to a lady called Violetta Sabo. Um, she served in, as a spy in France and, uh, and she got, I suppose, persuaded or she volunteered after her husband was killed at El Alamein. She had a very young daughter and the story was made into a film and albeit the film is not entirely accurate, um, it told the story of how Violetta worked behind the lines and was eventually <coughs> captured, tortured and executed by the Germans in 1945 just before the end of the war. But the poem was what really struck me at the time. And I want to read the poem today and leave it with the, you all with the thought that for me and for many of the people I speak to, when you decide to serve in the armed forces and when you decide that you are willing to take the risks, that you give everything, it is those memories and those thoughts that I think we should always keep dear to ourselves when we celebrate the nature of not only women in the armed forces, but men in the armed forces too. And the poem goes like this. The life that I have is all that I have, and the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause. For the peace of my years in the long green grass will be yours and yours and yours lest we forget. Thank you very much. I now uh, call on the Minister, Jamie Hepburn, to um, close the debate for the Government. Seven minutes there are about, Minister. Thank you very much, President Robson. Can I join with uh, others in thanking Maurice Corey for uh, bringing this uh, very important uh, debate, very interesting debate, to uh, the uh, Chamber, which has allowed us the chance to acknowledge the significant contribution that women have made to uh, our armed forces. It passed and uh, uh, given the nature of uh, the centenary, I think there has been a lot of focus in the past, but of course it is uh, very correct that we uh, recognise and acknowledge the, the ongoing and current contribution that women make to uh, the armed forces uh, today. Uh, we have uh, had the opportunity of a number of uh, debates in the, in the past to uh, mark the uh, the uh, contribution of our service personnel. Uh, President officer, few of, of any of the members of this part will uh, not have a, a family connection to the armed forces. Many uh, members, uh, a direct uh, connection having served uh, themselves. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, very correct that we have had this uh, opportunity. Can I join uh, Mr. Corey in welcoming uh, those he has invited to 
uh, the public gallery to witness uh, the debate. Uh, President officer, I think it was very correct that we had that uh, short uh, suspension and delay to allow them to, to witness uh, the debate. And I think uh, it was uh, very apt that uh, Mr Corey uh, requested such and very generous of you to, to grant that uh, short uh, suspension. I, uh, I suppose it allows me to thank those uh, here today uh, for their uh, service past uh, and uh, present. Uh, we have seen uh, in many recent years uh, significant uh, milestones, uh, President Officer 2014 saw the, uh, the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War uh, this year, uh, 2018. Uh, we'll of course see uh, the centenary of the end of uh, the, that, the, the Great War, the, the, the war that was supposed to end uh, all wars, which of course sadly has uh, not uh, been uh, the case. There will be uh, many events held over this year to acknowledge and recognise this uh, centenary and this uh, debate provides us an opportunity to, to do so uh, early in this uh, year. Uh, we, uh, we no longer have any living veterans from uh, the First World War, male or, or female, and indeed e even the, the Second World War, which has been mentioned, we uh, see uh, veterans uh, rapidly. Uh, we see the, the living memory of that, that uh, time uh, rapidly uh, passing from uh, living uh, memory. Uh, as the years pass by, so uh, that lived uh, memory it will uh, pass from even those generations who had a connection to those who lived uh, in those uh, uh, times. Uh, I was, uh, as a, a child and a young man, able to, to speak to my grandfather about his uh, experience, to, or at least the experience he was uh, willing or wanted to talk about. I'm sure there was uh, most of it he didn't want to talk about. Uh, also, my grandmother, uh, I think it was uh, uh, it mentioned the, the land army. It was it mentioned uh, my grandmother uh, served in uh, the land army. She was able to tell me about her uh, experience providing me with uh, at least a direct connection to that uh, generation. They were cherished family members for me, for my uh, children's uh, generation. Uh, they, they will never meet them, so they'll be more distant ancestors. So it is vitally important that we uh, do all we can to listen and value the memories of those who remain and can uh, uh, recall that time where we still have the, the chance uh, to do so. Uh, today's debate has, has rightly focused on, on women who've served in the armed forces over the the past 100 years, there are uh, uh, notable, additional notable uh, centenaries to honour alongside that of the uh, Women's Auxiliary, uh, uh, Women's Army Auxiliary uh, Corps. The Women's Royal Naval Service was also formed in uh, 2017. Uh, Keith Brown is uh, looking forward to, to a meeting with the Association of Wrens uh, later uh, this month. This year we also mark 100 years of the, the Royal Air Force and the formation at that time of the, the Women's Royal Air Force uh, in 1918 uh, as well. The First World War uh, it saw women serve formally in the armed forces for the, the first time. The roles were numerous and varied and of course included uh, wireless uh, telegraphist, the electrician, printing duties, motor vehicle, maintenance, tinsmiths, fitters uh, and uh, welders. Uh, and of course, uh, as is more often spoken of, uh, women made a massive contribution on the home front uh, uh, as well. We should also remember the women who were nurses and doctors in all uh, three services. The Navy and Army nursing services were uh, formalised in 1902 with the RAF following, uh, as I said, in uh, 1918. These women worked in difficult and challenging uh, conditions, tending uh, those with uh, dreadful inju injuries, appalling and hard to uh, imagine or conceive for uh, many, most of us in uh, this uh, chamber. Uh, Dr Elsie Inglis is, has been uh, mentioned by uh, many, understandably. Uh, she uh, worked against the convention of her day and against the uh, advice of uh, the uh, War Office uh, to uh, go uh, forth and uh, set up the, the Scottish Women's uh, Hospitals. Uh, the First Minister attended uh, an event in St Giles Cathedral in November last year to observe the centenary of uh, Dr Ingalls' uh, funeral. Uh, this debate actually allows me the chance to, to place on record my thanks to one of my constituents, a, a man called uh, Alan Cumming, who has uh, done a significant amount of work to help raise awareness of uh, Scottish uh, Women's uh, Hospitals. His own story is uh, quite an interesting one in that he uh, would uh, regularly go to Serbia because he's a football fan. He used to go and watch Red Star Belgrade uh, and was uh, uh, encountered a Serbian friend who told him, you're from Scotland, you must know about the Scottish Women's Hospitals. He was very embarrassed, that uh, never heard of them and it sparked a, an interest in the area and he has taken forward a significant amount of work pu uh, publishing uh, books, uh, uh, getting TV documentaries made and uh, establishing a, a website to commemorate and ensure people uh, remember the contribution of those uh, brave women who set up uh, the Scottish women's uh, hospitals. In the Second World War, uh, women again served with 
a distinction. It, uh, as has been mentioned, the, paying the ultimate sacrifice in many cases uh, in occupied uh, territory with organisations such as the Special Operations uh, Executive. Uh, of course, there were also uh, women involved at uh, Bletchley uh, Park who made such a, a significant contribution to the defeat of Nazism and fascism in uh, Europe. Other essential roles were carried out, as we've mentioned, by the uh, women in the Land Army uh, and other uh, services as well. And Kezia Dugdale's point, I'll be very happy for us to consider what we can do to better, undeniably can better recognise the effort, efforts that women made uh, in, that, uh, in that war effort. We're happy to hear from any member who thinks they have a particular suggestion as how we can better go uh, about that. As I said uh, earlier, uh, presiding officer, uh, it's understandable given this is a debate about the centenary of a particular event we have focused on, on uh, the history of matters uh, somewhat, but of course we should uh, place on record that women continue uh, to serve. They've served in, in active combat roles in Iraq, Afghanistan. Women have been working alongside their male counterparts in the armed services, providing humanitarian support, including disaster relief, a role that we should remind ourselves is an essential part of the work of the armed services, as is their role in keeping us safe. As Mr Corrie's motion sets out, the Royal Air Force has now opened all roles to women, the first of the three services to do so. The Army has lifted uh, the ban on women serving in close uh, combat roles. Uh, consideration has now been given to whether women should serve as Royal Marine uh, Commandos. Uh, it's uh, right, I think, that all branches of uh, the armed services look to follow the RAF's example and ensure all military roles are open and available uh, for women. Uh, we've heard uh, much today about the vital roles that women have played in the armed forces over the past 100 years, President Officer. Let me uh, assure all members of this uh, chamber that the Scottish Government is fully committed to supporting all of those who uh, serve in our armed forces, all those who have served in our armed forces in Scotland, men and women, we will continue to work collaborati uh, collaboratively with our partners in the public, private and third sectors to deliver uh, a support that we can uh, to those who serve and who have served. That's a commitment we take seriously and it's one I reiterate now uh, to this chamber. And once again, let me thank Mr Corrie for bringing this debate today. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate. Can I thank all members for their very interesting contributions and I suspend this meeting until 2.30.